<coughs> Thank you, Christina. Uh, I am delighted uh, to be back in my uh, old department or department where I did my PhD, as Christina said, and uh, very happy to be with uh, old long friends and uh, with my uh, professors <laughs> and uh, Ryan, Professor Ilya, Tim, and uh, and thank you, Christina, and uh, Fiona is not here, for Fiona and Anne, to make this uh, happen, to organize this, uh, this for me. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, to, uh, to share with you my, uh, my views on, or my take on what is happening uh, in the Middle East, the MENA region. Uh, and I would like to do it actually uh, in a way to connect uh, Turkey and the Middle East, but in a sort of a regional and uh, global uh, context. And uh, I will uh, uh, give you some uh, facts in the beginning, uh, some uh, uh, references. I'm quite sure uh, uh, you are all familiar with, with, with those, but, but it, uh, for me, and also for me to build my argument, uh, I have to lay out this uh, <coughs> you know, uh, framework uh, they are useful for, for, for it. Uh, and then uh, I will, at the end, do a little uh, reflections on, on, on IR theory and, and w how these things are also related to international relations theory. And, and then we will do actually a question and answer period and in a dialogical manner we will actually uh, uh, discuss. Anyway, uh, as uh, lots of people, policymakers, academics say, uh, tectonic uh, stones have moved in, in, in the MENA region. Uh, we were uh, very hopeful uh, a couple of years ago in 2010 when the Arab Spring uh, started. It was a process for transformation. We were actually uh, talking about uh, the post-colonial reconstruction of this geography in which uh, people first time, rather than being uh, recipients uh, and passives uh, of, of, of the uh, uh, Eurocentric history, they are actually uh, making history. They are they are uh, engaging uh, to, to, to change history for uh, what we call to be a subject of history, to be subject of their own history, to be digni to, 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 for, for dignity. It was actually an, an, an effort for, for dignity. And also, uh, in a way, uh, it is a process for uh, uh, equality and, and, and good, gov good governance. Uh, uh, nobody was asking for more religious uh, you know, ri you know, ri rights, uh, more uh, Sharia states, more authoritarian states. They were actually, like everybody in the world, going for a better state, an uh, uncorrupt state, uh, welfare, jobs, and, and, and uh, at least uh, to be able to see what happens next day, which is uh, certainty. And uh, so uh, it was uh, a hopeful moment. Uh, for, for two years, started, as you all know, Tunisia and, and, and Egypt. We got a little actually uh, problematic in, in, in Libya, but of course the crisis uh, started with, with Syria, and of course before, before Iraq, there is a very big uh, crisis situation uh, in, 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 in the Middle East. Hope uh, is replaced by, by uh, despair, uh, you know, uh, hope and transformation is, has been replaced by internal wars, human tragedies, uh, and and uh, as if actually all this uh, old language is coming back, uh, old language of Orientalism, of, of order, of, of state, and so on, so on and so forth. And we have actually uh, big uh, changes, but but unfortunately, uh, this the direction, the path, the trajectory of, of these changes are not moving uh, as as we actually expected or as we we, we like it. And uh, there are uh, actually, uh, we are living in a moment, in a globalizing uh, moment, a ter 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 turmoil, in which uh, in international uh, relations theory, we talk about the, 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 the fact that uh, the more globalized the world becomes, the more blurry uh, the, the difference between outside and inside becomes, <coughs> becomes too. And then inside becomes outside, outside becomes, becomes inside, and the world becomes extremely interconnected and some neoliberals says hyper-connected or interdependent. But right now, uh, we are uh, going through a moment or process in which really actually uh, we see 
the impacts, enormous uh, and unprecedented uh, impacts of the interconnectedness, what it means to be interconnected, what, what it means to be inter, inter, interdependent, and then outside really shaping relations in this, in, in, this, in this region. A number of things are happening at the same time in an in a, in a intertwined uh, fashion. Uh, let me actually make uh, seven points uh, uh, to, to, do, to delineate uh, what is happening uh, in, in, this, in this geography. First, we have, a, as you all know, big uh, refugee problem. And the refugee problem originates from Syria, Iraq, but also Afghani, Af Afghanistan. And, uh, and three countries uh, are, uh, you know, uh, maintaining these, uh, these refugees, uh, Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. Turkey is doing it, uh, we will discuss whether or not it's a good idea, but Turkey does it in a unilateral way, uh, and it is paying for it. It is actually regulating all these movements and mobilities and everything. And uh, 2.5 million uh, Syrians, refugees uh, in Turkey, but when we say 2.5 million Syrians, we are also including in it the uh, Iraqis and, and, and Af Afghanis. And, uh, and of course, uh, because of the proactive Turkish foreign policy, we have open door policies, no visa policies with Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Afghanistan. So, so in this sense, it is easy to come, 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 to, come to Turkey. Almost two million is in uh, in Jordan and, and, and Lebanon, and this is actually being financed and organized by the international organiza or organizations. So we are talking about almost five million uh, refugees, and uh, and if uh, the uh, conflict situation gets more accelerated. Uh, this uh, proxy wars, uh, you know, and geopolitical games uh, get more and more deepened and, and, and widened in this region. Uh, the expectation is that these refugees, for instance, uh, uh, you know, if Aleppo falls, you are talking about another million refugees. So we are talking about almost 10 million potentially that might come from, from these regions. But uh, if you are doing conflict resolution and, and, and migration studies, and if you are looking at the refugee and migration situation in Africa, originating from mainly uh, organizations or terror organizations like uh, ISIL, Boko Haram and, 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 and the others. On the top of it, uh, if you look at actually the refugee and migration situation that are occurring because of uh, lack of access to water, hygiene, inequality, poverty, so on and so forth, you know, estimates actually is alarming. Uh, we are talking about almost 20 million refugees, you know, that might be you know, moving towards, uh, towards, towards Europe in the, in the years to come. As a matter of fact, New York uh, economist, uh, New York University economist uh, Rubini, uh, after uh, visiting all the European uh, countries, wrote a sort of a provocative, uh, you know, piece in the project syndicate and, and saying that if the Europe is not able to handle one million refugees, so this, this actually uh, 20 million in the near future is really alarming. And in that context, in the Washington circles and the other areas, you know, this, uh, you know, co possibility of third world war and those kind of actually alarming and, and you know, security oriented possibilities are being actually discussed because of the refugee issue. When we ask why this uh, refugee issue is becoming really alarming, uh, especially in Syria, Iraq, uh, and, 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 and this geography, of course, so, you know, we hit the second problem, the problem of ISIL. And, and ISIL actually is being expanded, and if I will actually elaborate on it if there are questions about the, about the ISIL. But let me make, uh, to make it a telegraphic form, to finish this, this pay, the, the, the talk uh, in a time that, that we have enough time for, for questions and, answer, and, and discussions. ISIL is, uh, as it starts two years ago, and as where he, it is right now, it is more than a terror organization, less than a state. So it is between, actually, terror and state. And as a matter of fact, uh, in the way in which uh, ISIL uh, or IS uh, exerts in influence, widens its influence uh, in, in the region, it is true, its claim to the state, uh, uh, rather than being a terror organization. So, so in this sense, the more ISIL gets the possibility of establishing a state in Syria and, and Iraq, which means if more possibility occurs in terms of Syria and uh, you know, Iraq failing uh, to, be a, to, be a, to be a state, then, then, then ISIL, you know, uh, expands, ISIL, ISIL, ISIL widens its influence. So, so in this sense, they are brutal. 
that they are, they are grotesque, you know, and, 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 and the way in which they expand, the more refugees we have, actually. And, uh, but of course, uh, these are all intertwined, as I said, uh, sort of interconnected. When we ask this question, when we pose the question, why ISIL has really, has become really strong in a very short time, in the two years we are talking about it, is actually, uh, you know, uh, taking this place, that place, and, and, and the other, other place. Of course, uh, you know, we have a you know, state problem in, in Syria, mainly Syria and Iraq. What I call, and what, uh, what many other calls, is a pale state situation in Syria, in, 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 in Iraq, but also in Libya, in Yemen, in, in Sudan, and in Somali. So these failed states are mushrooming uh, all over the world, and that actually uh, strengthens, strengthens the argument that the more failed states we have, the more refugees we will actually have in this, in this, in this region. By failed state, uh, I mean actually a state that, are not, that is not able to control uh, what goes on in their own territories, that is not able and capable of controlling uh, the mobilities, border mobilities, you know, mobilities, uh, in, in, in so on, actually. So when, I, when we look at ISIL's claim to be a state, and when we look at Syria and Iraq as being failed states, this is a big challenge on uh, our idea of, of the state, Westphalian state, because ISIL claim to the state is not a territorial state. It is actually taking place in two states, and also it has actually a trans-border, transnational references. So, so, so in this sense, uh, all this uh, ISIL and state, failed state problem also pose question, academically, theoretically, and policy-wise, about the way in which we think about the state. Maybe the existing state thinking is not actually able to deal with these kind of, these kind of problems. It's a very important uh, question of the state. In front of Rayan Mahon, when I finished my, when I start my PhD, the first courses we were talking about the state, and after 20 something years, we are back to actually uh, the state, uh, state, state problem. Why actually this state problem, ISIL and refugees are really alarming? Then of course we come to the fourth, uh, fourth development, which I call, with reference to Zbigniew Brzezinski, regional geopolitical power games that are played by, uh, by actually actors such as uh, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and, and Gulf, Gulf, uh, Gulf states, or state-like like, uh, you know, uh, uh, ent ent entities. And as a matter of fact, uh, what goes on uh, in this region uh, is, on the one hand, a big, big, big human tragedy. On the other hand, a space for geopolitical power configuration or power, power gain. Russia is there in terms of uh, geopolitical interest. Iran is doing what it is doing in terms of geopolitical, geopolitical interest. Saudi Arabia is doing what it is doing in terms of geopolitical power. So, so we are actually also experiencing a big reconfiguration of power in this, in, this, in this region. This actually takes two forms. One form actually is uh, they do so, they do what they do, through what we call, and recently this is also introduction into uh, the war literature, proxy wars. And, 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 and the Syria is in fact actually on the one hand internal war when it comes to uh, what goes on in Syria. It is a you know, uh, kind of a war because of uh, ISIL, but at the same time a proxy war for Russia and Iran. And as a matter of fact, the way Russia looks at Syria is, is definitely like this. They don't care what goes on in, in, in Syria, but what they care actually is their geopolitical presence in this, in this region, which starts 2004 with Georgia a pair uh, up, up there, then 2010 Ukraine through Iran and now Syria and Iraq and the, the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. So it's a big axis based on geopolitical uh, thinking and, and this discourse. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran uh, relations are also based on proxy wars. For instance, poor Yemen is being actually, uh, you know, fought over this proxy, pro 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 uh, being, 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 being a proxy. The second, uh, second layer, which is as important as uh, the first one, as the proxy war one, uh, and, and, and also I, I pay attention to in this, in this uh, uh, paper or, or talk, is that None of these actors that look at the situation on the basis of geopolitical interest and, and power games, you know, look at the refugee problems as a problem. 
As a matter of fact, Russia doesn't have any refugee problem. Iran doesn't have any refugee problem. Saudi Arabia doesn't have any refugee problem. No refugee wants to go to Russia. No refugee wants to go to Iran. No refugee wants to go to Saudi Arabia. So, so, so in this sense, uh, for instance, uh, I might elaborate on that. I attend a meeting in Carnegie, Moscow, and it's the Russian's way of looking at refugee problem is not a problem in terms of humanitarianism, in terms of human tragedy, but it's a problem that is an asset for Russian uh, you know, foreign policy to expand in, in, this, in, this, in, the, in this region. So, so in this sense, uh, there are also interesting disconnects between the way that actors look at the situation and, 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 and the problems that, that confront us and face us. The fifth one is uh, what I call the lack of regional leadership. United States is actually is not powerful as, as, as before, and, and the international community is not, is not powerful. European Union is not really actually relevant, and Europe is paralyzed because of the, you know, I will come to that in a second, because of the refugee problem. So, so in this sense, what uh, Mersheimer calls great powers don't have very much saying in this you know, in this, in this, in this, in this region, United States actually uh, has a different uh, vision of, of the region uh, in terms of its uh, sort of foreign policy, collaboration, Pacific China, so and so and so forth. But, but nevertheless, there is definitely a hegemonic leadership problem or hegemonic leadership vacuum going on in this in this region, which opens up spaces or from which or, organization like ISIL and the others feed, and, and so so so. These things are actually making the problems much more deepened and, and, and wider. And then sixthly, with reference to uh, Daryl Ajamolu's work, we have also a big problem in this region. Even uh, those countries like Egypt, Tunisia, uh, and, and uh, some of the MENA region countries, uh, countries uh, where they have actually not that ranking in the you know, UNDP's Human Development Index, but, but they, they actually suffer from lack of inclusive institutions to be able to actually fight against corruption, to be able to go for transparency, accountability, to demand from, from the state. So we have on the one hand uh, the lack of inclusive institutions, weaken, uh, you know, sort of weak civil, 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 society, civil society, and on the top of it, uh, the idea of uh, what can be called inclusive citizenship or we call it in Turkey equal citizenship among identities. So, so we have a kind of a common language, common common reference in which different identities might talk about rights and freedoms rather than purely identities and recognition, so and so forth. That actually also opens a space for the rise of what we call sectarian uh, politics. On the one hand, uh, the, the, this fight and all competition between Shiite forces based on Iran and Sunnite forces based on uh, based on uh, <coughs> Saudi Arabia and, and little 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 Turkey. So 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 all of these actually uh, things being discussed in a not a not something that could be a solution to what goes on, but that could actually escalate the, the problems. That is a sectarian politics. But of course, the more sectarian the politics becomes, the lack, the more people actually talk about the, the possibility of citizenship, the possibility of rights and rights and rights and uh, freedom. So these are the actually seven processes, seven challenges that are going on that actually make the situation uh, problematic. From this uh, seven, uh, I will come to the second part uh, shortly. My argument actually is uh, from, from this seven processes and challenges, uh, we have actually two significant uh, crises going on at the same time. And, uh, and one crisis is uh, the crisis of refugee crisis or, or the crisis that, uh, that is constructed on the basis of the refugee problem. Refugee problem in terms of the numbers, in terms of the implications, in terms of the ability of the state to actually manage the refugee problems. Refugee problem isn't a problem, it's a crisis. And it's a Eurocentric crisis. And, 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 uh, and, and uh, when you look at Europe, when you go to Europe, Rubini is right, I agree with him that the more actually I attend the meetings in Europe, the more actually I travel to Europe, Europe is paralyzed. Uh, 
you know, by this refugee crisis. They cannot handle it. They, they are racist, they are xenophobic, they are incapacitated, the, 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 the best. The best, uh, the strongest actor is Germany, and, 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 and Germany and Turkey are doing bilateral talks. Germany and, and Europe are actually trying to deal with it, but even Germany, one million makes a big, 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 you know, challenge. Uh, so, so in this sense, uh, one crisis, crisis is, is actually the refugee crisis, which is uh, European-centered. And, 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 and this crisis uh, has two components. ISIL is pushing this and failed state is actually accelerating, accelerating it. And when you go to Europe, yes, we have actually uh, big massacres in, 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 in Paris, the possibility of attack in Munich and all this actually ISIL references. But the, 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 the focus of the discourse, the focus of the discussion is based on refugees. And, and Europe, you know, deals with this problem and Europe focuses exclusively on this, almost exclusively on this refugee problem. But when you come to North uh, America, or especially United States and, and Washington, you get to the second crisis, and this second crisis actually is the war against ISIL, and, and whether or not this war can be, you know, uh, won whether or not it is possible for this coalition forces, United States-led coalition forces, to, to actually beat ISIL, to, to kind of contain, to, 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 to contain, contain ISIL. And, and in that crisis, uh, we'll talk less about refugees, more about ISIL, and, and the <coughs> references are, uh, again, ISIL fight state, but, but then actually these, uh, you know, countries that are playing these geopolitical games. Russia is extremely important, Iran and Saudi Arabia. As a matter of fact, I don't know if, if you are uh, following it, uh, it was uh, yesterday, the Geneva deliberations, Geneva negotiations about Syria and ISIL was going to start, but it couldn't start. Now maybe 29th of, 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 of January it's going it's gonna, to gonna start, but still the problem is that it might not start. Turkey is not happy about the Kurdish forces being invited to this world, but, but when you look at these Geneva talks and, and the way that, that you know, ISIL, the war against ISIL is being dealt with, you have less references to the refugee problem. Although they are interconnected, but you know, when you get into it, uh, you know, there are actually separate, uh, separate items, uh, items in it. And Turkey uh, takes place at the intersection of these, these two crises. And, 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 and as a matter of fact, Turkey has these refugees, 2.5 million, and containing them, and, 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 and managing, uh, managing, managing them. But at the same time, in terms of uh, opening up the military uh, bases, in terms of controlling the borders, Turkey is also pivot in the war against, against ISIL. As a matter of fact, there was long discussions between United States and Turkey in terms of opening the military bases in Turkey against, against ISIL because it takes only six minutes to hit ISIL from Turkey, whereas 45 to an hour from, from actually Saudi Arabia and the other, other forces. So, so in this sense, uh, Turkey not only taking place at the intersection of these two crises, but also considered, considered uh, a pivot uh, for, for these countries to deal with these two, two crises. And, uh, and in, this, in that sense, uh, this actually uh, uh, creates risks for Turkey, but on the other hand, it opens up for the government of Turkey to have new maneuvers, even though Turkey recently suffered from uh, you know, problems of democracy, rights, and freedoms, but, but, but nevertheless, interestingly enough, uh, in uh, last year, uh, since last year, we've been actually a very fast uh, revitalization between Turkey and the West, Turkey and US, Turkey and NATO, Turkey and EU, and Turkey, Turkey and, 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 and Europe. I myself, as uh, the director of Istanbul Police Center, has been working very heavily on re-energizing Turkey-EU relations, but of course, when we were working on this, our idea was to do so on the basis of enlarging, up upgrading, consolidating Turkish democracy. But right now we have a puzzle because uh, Turkish democracy is not being upgraded, is not being consolidated, but there is a big interest in Turkey and Turkey's rank in the foreign policy list of the European countries and Washington is going very, very, uh, very, 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 very up. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is happening uh, actually in a time uh, uh, Turkey is uh, going through a number of uh, internal, uh, you know, uh, challenges. 
Of course, the main challenge, as I said, is a democracy, ch democracy uh, challenge. The second challenge is uh, I was uh, engaged with it as one of the uh, members of the Wise, Pe Wise People Commission to, to actually negotiate with the PKK to, to, to disarm arm the, arm the conflict and, and to actually you know, replace conflict with, with politics. But right now uh, we have a back movement to do the conflict and there's a huge escalated actually conflict between Turkey and the PKK with different, different, different forms. I will elaborate on it if there are, there are questions. And of course, uh, you know, thirdly, Turkey is going through, just started going through a new constitution process. But, but in that sense, uh, of course, there is actually two visions of Turkey being played out and negotiated over the new, new constitution. Whether uh, we have a democratic Turkey and new constitution that goes along with that, or we have a strong Turkey, a pivotal Turkey in this crisis, that the, the, the constitution goes along with that. The second or the latter option is called in Turkey presidentialism. Turkey might actually go for presidentialism. And so far, actually, European countries and American countries are going OK with it because of this you know, shift of interest and so on and so, on and so forth. The lastly, uh, without actually uh, confusing uh, you uh, too much, uh, let me make my uh, conclusion uh, points, and then uh, we should discuss. Uh, I might actually leave this uh, to, you, to those who are interested in. Uh, we have actually lots of uh, points and numbers and uh, maps here. It might be helpful. Uh, The puzzle actually is, uh, of course, I explained the puzzle a bit. Why this uh, revitalization between the West and Turkey, when Turkey is not uh, that democratic and, and that, you know, sort of uh, right-oriented, and uh, and why, why this is happening? Of course, it's happening on the basis of these two crises and Turkey's pivotal role in this, in this into crisis. But uh, what it means for Turkey, you know, what, what it means for Turkey to actually accept this uh, revitalization, this re-energizing energizing, uh, mo moment. In the Cold War years, uh, from 1945 to 1990, Turkish foreign policy identity was what we call a buffer state identity. Turkey was actually a buffer state between two superpowers. Buffer state, one of the significant bu buffer, 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 buffer state in, the, in this balance of power between, between uh, two, 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 two camps. But of course, you know, the Berlin Wall crumbled, the Soviet Union collapsed, and Turkey during the 90s actually uh, had a kind of a foreign policy identity search. We had a little crisis moment because we were not buffer state anymore, because there was no Soviet Union, there was no balance of power. The world going to a new type of post-Cold War period, either multipolar or, or unipolar, but not bipolar. So you cannot be a buffer in that, in that context. And... Uh, during the uh, 2000, with the AK Party government, with, with the EU integration process and everything, Turkey kind of found a foreign policy identity for itself. This was a, what we call proactive foreign policy, a <coughs> constructive foreign policy. Turkey is an economically dynamic entrepreneurial state. Turkey is mediating in the conflicts between different actors in, in the Middle East you know, Syria and, and Israel, and uh, some of the actors in the Balkans, you know, Serbians and Korech and so on, so on and so forth, is actually a kind of an actor that could talk to Eastern, uh, Eastern countries and Western countries at the same time, that could be actually a double language, Turkey's double language. Turkey is a bridge. If you come to Turkey and Istanbul, where I live, you see the bridge between East and, and West, and it says, Anatolia, so Asia starts here, you know, Europe starts kind of things, the geographic bridge. And these are actually energy hub and so on and so forth. And Turkey was kind of independent in the way in which uh, it, it actually engaged regionally and, and globally. There has been an act you know, attraction to Turkey, and Turkey is this, this new role, humanitarian state in Africa. And, you know, Turkey is everywhere, in, in Africa, in Latin America, in actually South Asia, in, in the Middle East and everything. And uh, one actually feat of uh, one of the you know uh, feet of Turkey was on Europe, strongly Europe with the EU, but also Turkey was expanding towards the east. So, so in this sense, we had this dialectic that the more stronger Turkey anchored to Europe, the more actually uh, 
uh, attractive uh, and the more welcoming Turkey will be in Asia, Middle East, and, 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 and Africa. So there was this you know, anti-Orientalist, critical on Orientalism, critical on Eurocentrism, East-West connection, rather than, rather, than, rather than divide. But right now, when we look at uh, you know, uh, uh, Tur the revitalization process between Turkey and the West, on the basis of these two crises with Europe, and, and actually with, with the United States, with NATO and with, with the EU, I kind of see kind of a, actually a return to the buffer zone uh, ident identity. Turkey's interest in Turkey is growing. Turkey is, uh, less, you know, the, 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 the place of Turkey in the foreign policy list of these big countries are going up all the time. And everybody is actually interested in, in, in Turkey, talking about Turkey. But uh, the discourse, that is being used to, used uh, in these discussions in this re-energizing uh, mode of uh, you know engagement with Turkey, you get actually this uh, return to buffer zone in the in the name of uh, Turkey being container, Turkey being balancer, from European perspective, uh, from the refugee crisis, Turkey is considered as a very very important container of the refugees. And if, if Turkey contains 2.5 million and refugees do not come to Europe, then of course Europe is not going to have very much problem. So, so in this sense, uh, all Europe and European states and European Union at large talks about is how to advance, how to enhance Turkey's capacity, not only to contain, but also to manage uh, you know, the refugees in, in, in Turkey. Management in the sense of need assessment, management in the sense of creating, for instance, uh, you know, work permits for the refugees, and management in the sense of educational uh, facilities. Uh, you know, let me actually mention that 375,000 of this uh, 2.5 million are kids going to school, primary school, secondary school, and uh, high school in Turkey. So education constitutes extremely important need assessment, assessment part of the refugee crisis. So, so in this sense, from the European perspective, you actually you sort of see indirectly, ex implicitly, not explicitly, you know, kind of a, approach Turkey as a container, as a buffer vis-a-vis -vis refugee, vis -vis refugees. From the Washington, United States, and, and, and the, you know, the, the Western point of view on the base of security, on the base of NATO, Turkey is also regarded approach as a container, as a buffer vis-a-vis -vis ISIL's expansion, because it is only Turkey, you know, that could actually uh, make, that, that could enable the Western coalition to contain ISIL or, 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 or to actually decrease the, the, the power and influence of, of, of ISIL. So, so in this sense, interestingly, we have this revitalization moment in which we are also observing the revitalization of this buffer zone identity, this time uh, you know, expressed uh, as a buffer and container and, 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 and balancer. The point actually is, uh, let me finish here, when you are buffer, when you are container, when you are balancer, the primacy mode of operation is based on security, not economy, not democracy, not not uh, not uh, not uh, humanitarianism, not mediation, not conflict resolution. So, so in this sense, uh, you know, Turkey is kind of a extremely strategic buffer, strategic container, based on. Uh, the primacy of security concerns over the other concerns, rights, freedoms, liberties, uh, so on and so, and so forth. So of course, so when that happens, uh, you could actually explain why revitalization occurring without very much uh, discussion of uh, what goes on in Turkey, democratically, in terms of rights and, 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 and freedoms. So, uh, so we had actually uh, this uh, moment uh, of revitalization uh, going, going, going on. And uh, maybe actually I'll stop here and then uh, I was going to talk about the Kurdish question, but I'm quite sure there will be you know, questions that I will actually elaborate on that. Anyway, thank you very much.